Good day, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Harris Lizidakis. I am the Chief Executive Officer Designate of the World Organization of Family Doctors, WONCA. And I would like to welcome you all in this uh, uh, webinar on uh, education and training and the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, before we start, I would like just to uh, inform uh, our attendees that uh, you can uh, interact on Zoom uh, through two ways, uh, using uh, the chat button uh, that is located um, on the bottom of your screen, uh, where you can exchange uh, messages with the other um, attendees and the panelists, and also using the Q&A button in which you can write questions and we will do our best to reply either via text or pick one or two questions that are the most relevant <clears throat> so that we can address them uh, all together uh, out loud. Uh, there is also a live streaming on uh, Facebook and we will be taking comments from there uh, and we will be reading <clears throat> our, your posts. Um, and so without further ado, I would like to introduce you uh, to Dr. Garth Manning, the Chief Executive Officer of uh, Wonka. Good day, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this, the third in a series of Wonka webinars. Today, the topic is education and training in the time of pandemic. The session will be led by Professor Val Wass, Chair of Wonka's Working Party on Education, ably assisted by Dr. Victor Ring of Canada. Presenters will include Dr. Camille Gajiria Ria of UK, Dr. Vivi Martinez Bianchi of USA and Argentina, and Dr. Robin Ramsey of the UK. We'd also like to offer a warm Wonka welcome to Dr. Gaia Gamawaga of WHO. And we're delighted, Gaia, that you could join us for this important topic. topic. Of course, we'll also be trying to take a number of your questions as Harris described in his opening remarks. And these will be monitored by Drs. Sonia Tsukagoshi and Kim Yu. And panelists for these will include Professor Mary Andradas of Pakistan, Dr. Nagwa Nashat of Egypt, and Dr. Joy Mugambi of Kenya. So really a very international panel of experts. But before I hand over to Val and Victor um, and the panelists, I'd like to first hand over to our Wonka president, Dr. Donald Lee, for his opening remarks. Donald. Good day, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the third Wonka webinar. Family doctors around the world are continuing to rise to the challenge of this awful pandemic. We are working with our public health colleagues, our specialist colleagues, and all healthcare workers. In the midst of the massively increased workload for family doctors, I'm proud of the level of support and collegiality displayed within and across our member organizations and from region to region. I'm also proud of the work that all of you are doing as family doctors. Next, please. Colleagues are disseminating scientific advice clinical updates, reflective messages, and professional support through their social media links and connections. They are keeping in touch with each other regularly, like family members, relaying information, urging courage in these extraordinary times. Tonight, next please, our working group education of education led by Chair Val Ross and Vice Chair Victor Ng, together with contributions from invited colleagues and WHO colleagues, will consider some challenges in training family medicine as COVID-19 affects everyone's well-being and daily lives. Before I hand over to the chair, I would like to share two personal reflections about education and training. The first one is a quote from the Lancet Commission, Health Professionals for 21st Century. To have a positive effect on the functioning of health systems and ultimately on health outcomes of patients and populations, educational institutions have to be designed to generate an optimum instructional process. The second one is education and training is not about teaching people to know what they don't know. It's about teaching them to behave as they do not behave. So with this, I would like to hand over to Chair Val. 
Well. Thank, you, thank you, Donald, and thank you so much for the introduction and to Wonka World for setting this up for us as a working party. We're really very grateful indeed. Thank you, Donald, for your quote from the Lancet report, which many of us have been struggling so hard to deliver. And then suddenly we have this pandemic upon us all, which has really opened, I feel, a Pandora's box of issues for us as educators. Today, it's going to be difficult to rather do more than skim the surface of the issues that are out there for you all. Um, we're going to stick to our continuum of education, which is one co-working party we've been trying to do. Those of you who know me well know that I dislike the borders between undergraduate, postgraduate and CV and continuous professional development, but it seemed the best framework today. So we're going to start with medical students and the issues for medical schools. Then I'm delighted that we can move into postgraduate and introduce you to the Wonka challenge of delivering educational globally and updating new knowledge, Gaia. And then we will be looking at the real challenges of redeploying trainees to be doing new things. And finally, we'll bring it together by looking at the broad educational issues of delivering globally to people with completely diversified educational needs. Before we kick off, and I'll leave the presenters to present themselves, just a thanks to our extra panelists, Maria from Pakistan, Joy from Kenya, and Nagwa from Egypt. But a big, big thank you to Sonia Sukhat Goshi and to Kim Yu, who are going to be beavering away behind the, behind the scenes, looking at what the chat you're sending in and delivering it to Victor, who's then going to be delivering the questions. We're going to have a gap between each of the presentations, well, between undergraduate, postgraduate, and CPD for your questions so that we can be having a dialogue and looking hopefully to areas where we can give, bring more education to you all. But I'm going to hand over to my partner in crime, Victor now, who's going to broadly cover what we plan to do. Thank you, Victor. Great, thank you, Val, and uh, welcome to everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all. And uh, thank you for joining our webinar. So we'll get started. Um, like Val was saying, the um, divisions between the, the divisions between undergraduate medical education, postgraduate, and CPD is in some ways very, very artificial. And hopefully, despite the fact that we've um, artificially tried to separate each of these um, um, sort of continuum of education, hopefully we'll be able to uh, to link them all together with you quite well. So if we think just in the first segment in the undergraduate medical education, you know, in, in the pandemic world, how do we actually get from traditionally, if you think back in the days of the anatomy theater, how do we move from that structure all the way to perhaps a very virtual way of teaching? So how do we do that? And how are medical students in the world of pandemic and COVID, where they're not able to go to classes, how are they supposed to adapt and move on? The other challenge that we'll explore and hopefully touch on during the question period is, you know, in, in countries or, or in systems where technology is not as prevalent, how do we actually ensure that students are able to have the technological abilities and, and resources to be able to engage in those classes that are mostly virtual? So those are some of the, the questions and challenges we'll be left with as we evolve um, our, our medical education during the COVID-19 uh, and beyond. Next slide, Harris. And in postgraduate med medical education, so teaching uh, residents and, and registrars and postgraduate trainees, how do we move from a didactic system of teaching, so in a traditional classroom, to one that is virtual? So how do we assess trainees in that setting? How do we look at them as they do their assessments in their virtual clinics? How do we judge whether they are um, using the correct judgment, the selectivity of tests, and also uh, investigations and blood work and imaging and so forth? How are we able to do that? And then on top of that, how are we able to uh, mentor and, and, and role model a skill that we ourselves as teachers are only being exposed to for the very first time that's very new to us? So how do we as teachers are able to do that, um, enable ourselves to have those skills quickly to be able to actually role model and showcase that to our students and our trainees? So that's gonna be a challenge for us as well. Then how do we, on top of that, deliver that curriculum in a very quick way despite sort of this novel um, uh, issue that's come onto us quite quickly. Next slide, Harris. And finally, I put in brackets there, adaptive CPD, adaptive continuing professional development. 
So in, in the world of novel um, diseases and illnesses such as COVID-19, how are we able to get information to frontline practitioners quickly? So you'll recall on the left slide in the previous epidemic of, of HIV and AIDS, information flowed very, very quite slowly um, in the sense of um, practitioners in many cases were afraid to touch patients, worried that they would get the disease themselves, nurses, physicians, and it took a very long time and a lot of navigation and advocacy for people to actually realize that touching and, and, and um, being close to patients, you would not get the disease. So if you look on the right side, this was a very recent study that was published just April 22nd of 2020, um, thinking about the resources that we need for COVID and intubation and ventilators and resources such as that in uh, critical care and, and uh, ICU, how do we get that information quickly um, to frontline practitioners so that they can incorporate that behaviors and that um, level of knowledge and competencies when they're practicing uh, uh, with patients. So it's gonna be a challenge for us to be able to have that deliberate adaptive CPD that goes on to the, um, to the uh, frontline provider in a very quick sense. And something really that we've been struggling to do is that once we finish with postgraduate medical education, in many cases, uh, practicing physicians do not have a, a, a strict curriculum to follow and there really is, is limited feedback that we as a profession or society are able to provide um, physicians in many cases about their professional development. So that's going to be a challenge for us as these novel um, entities and novel diseases really occur in the world. So thank you. Thank oh. Get it right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. So now shall we kick off formally and are you ready Camille, could you unmute? And I'm delighted that Camille Gajira, who's at the, well you'll introduce yourself Gajira, I'm delighted that you're going to be talking to us about your challenges, thank you. Thank you, um, my name's Camille, I'm part of the faculty at Imperial College GP Teaching. And like many of you, we have moved our curriculum online in the last six weeks, so very rapidly. And um, there is an array of challenges that you will recognise um, that we will go through. Um, next slide, please, Harris, and the next one. Thank you. Um, so moving the um, existing material online, um, there's a lot of help available from the Academy of Medical Educators, AMI. They've run a series of excellent webinars. Um, and it's important that um, we maintain our educational um, standards within these. It's not a direct um, transfer. Uh, another issue has been faculty development. We're all at different stages of our online um, teaching journey. So there are some people who are highly experienced in flipped classroom, for example, and there's others who hadn't been doing any online teaching. Then the issue of resources. Um, every medical school has access to different levels of resources. And um, this links into platform choice. I wouldn't worry too much about which platform you choose. It's just important to get to know the platforms really well. A key issue, a key challenge we've been facing is that this is all happening in the context of COVID. It's not just moving things online independently of that. And because the effect of COVID has been vast um, on each one of us, the pastoral support aspect is really key, both for students and for faculty. Um, and one of the things we've done is try to um, keep a well-being aspect to our work within the faculty as well. Um, Linked into the pastoral support is the issue of equity that was touched on in the introduction. And I think we'll discuss that more in the questions. Um, but I wanted to emphasize that it's not just about whether students have access to laptops, um, but it's also things like what the, their environment is like for learning. They may be living in crowded situations with, uh, in a noisy place. Uh, this links into assessment. Um, Imperial College ran what we believe is the first online open book written finals. Um, and this, sorry, there's echo. And um, 
And, and this may sound alarming at first, but we found that uh, the um, psychometrics matched with previous years, which was incredible. Um, there were lots of safeguards put in place by the team. Um, for example, uh, the questions only had about a minute uh, time to answer each one. So even if a student was to look something up, it would be very difficult for them to find an answer that quickly. And um, the content of the questions was, was not just simply knowledge based. So it made it very difficult for students to te cheat. Um, it was important for Imperial to carry out the assessments um, for finals because we don't want to leave a gap in the workforce. We don't want to have a whole cohort of medical students who can't graduate and then not serve in, in the workforce at a time when we need the workforce. But similarly, we needed professional standards to be maintained. We couldn't just pass them without checking that they'd achieved the uh, competencies we would normally expect. Um, and we also need to consider that the pandemic effects will last for months, if not years. How do we redesign for this in the longer term? So these are thoughts we need to keep in mind. Next slide, please. Um, what I'm really excited about is the opportunities that we've had um, as a result. Um, we've been able to implement things very quickly, and I'm sure a lot of you have found that a lot of bureaucracy has been removed. Um, it's been an opportunity to develop community. We have, uh, both within the team, also amongst the medical students themselves, um, but also in terms of making links with the local community. Um, I think this has been phenomenal. Um, one point I wanted to mention was about our students volunteering. Um, this has been a formalized process, which we've worked with um, so societies, um, with the British Medical Association to make sure that it's safe, but also um, respecting that students' role is as learners. Um, and although we need to be careful and um, make sure that students don't um, get into dangerous situations at the same time our students have been saying things like they've learned a lot more by by actually doing something that is useful so i was wondering that this effect of service learning i wonder if it's actually going to make a big difference and make um sort of improve the quality of what our students um, come out with, like, what, does it drive professionalism? Does it, does it, is it more authentic? Is it more value driven? Um, next slide, please. So in summary, it is a challenging time. You have a lot of the important skills already and we are always learning. Um, and I will leave you with some uh, references on the next slide which I found really interesting um, and uh, of lots of uh, opportunities within the references to explore further. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Camille. And now, Victor, are you ready to kick off with the questions? Yes, thanks, Val. So we had uh, quite a, a robust uh, question and answer and, and chat uh, forum. And I know uh, our colleagues, Kim and Sonia, are, are feverishly typing and sending them to us. So I've got a first question for Nagwa from Egypt. So um, I, I uh, uh, briefly mentioned this in the preamble, and I know um, uh, um, Camille had also referred to this, is the idea of technology. So recognizing that in a virtual learning environment, you need to have uh, resources and technology, both for the teacher and the preceptor, but also for the students. Um, in, in different places around the world, maybe using your, your own as a, a context network, well, how have you uh, had to navigate this and, and what kind of um, uh, uh, solutions do you think you can offer uh, or suggestions that, that other um, countries or contexts can, can do to equip their students and teachers with the technological resources to pursue virtual learning? Um, uh, thanks, Victor, for the question. Um, it's really um, an important one because we had that uh, technology in equity here, uh, having that most of the students doesn't have laptops and having that knowing that the family has may have more than one child, uh, so all of them cannot use the same computer at the same time. So for that thing, we had to use the applications that can be uploaded on the smartphone. Uh, 
So our the smartphone, if you are going to use uh, the smartphone, we have to make sure that any app that we would like our students to use or to navigate through should be found on the smartphone. This is number one. One of the important things also uh, we had here in Egypt, the Egyptian Knowledge Bank, which is a learning management system, a strong one, by the way, had been evolved in the last uh, two years. This one has many modules, virtual modules for the uh, base level, for the clinic levels, and we also have the virtual cases. Maybe we were not using that in the previous uh, years, but with the sudden shift, we had to go through. We had almost virtual cases and many of the disciplines where the uh, student can go to the uh, to the system and interview the virtual case from the history up to the management and also we have modules in the anatomy in the uh, in the surgery in the gyne and ops for the in instrument for the 3d anatomy and so on so for all of these we had we didn't use before but we are using it right now to compensate for that remote sudden uh, teaching uh, uh, shift um, sometimes we have also students who don't have the accessibility to go for that and we totally understand that because the shift is completely emergency without any of preparation we go virtual means that we do schedule a zoom meeting with our students trying to explain for them uh, the things that we already um, have been tackling during the lectures and trying to do role plays with them simulating with our colleagues uh, a scenario for something uh, that is demanded a certain competency for them in order to demonstrate a role play uh, where we can tackle a few things required for their competency this is what had been done so far regarding the technology part here thank you Hey, thank you, uh, Nagwa. So I think we have another question, and I'm going to direct this question to Robin. Um, so uh, there's been some discussion about what we, I guess, consider now is Zoom fatigue. So we're always online uh, from one meeting to the next. I guess sometimes you, you go to the next meeting or the next lecture, and you don't even know what you're lecturing about. Uh, so, so I guess in the world of a virtual classroom or a virtual learning setting, uh, whether I guess it's synchronous or asynchronous, you know, how do we manage that, that what we call you know, Zoom fatigue? How do we ensure that both from the student perspective and the, and the educator perspective that, that we can mitigate some of that? Robin, could you share some perspectives? Uh, yeah, thanks, Victor. Um, I was gonna just share my experience of the, of the tutor fatigue that um, we'd experienced tutoring online. I mean, I, our tutors actually teach her online all the time. So this is something that's quite familiar to me. And we mitigate that through teamwork, basically. Um, we have, I'm gonna talk about, and in, in when I talk later on about connection, um, we have regular uh, time to connect and reflect as tutors um, on a weekly basis on, on issues such as fatigue so that we can support each other and try and mitigate any issues that, that we have. and. Um, I think as time has gone on, that's been the most powerful tool to to try and deal with that. So that's maybe something that uh, is worth setting up if tutors are now moving into online um, teaching from being face to face. It's very difficult because you're often speaking to a computer screen. It's faceless. There's, there's very little interaction and um, that in itself um, poses challenges. So the other thing we've done is we've we've allowed tutors to feed give peer-to-peer -peer support and feedback on sessions that we've been running to try and help improve our, our skills and our use of different techniques on, online. Thank you, Robin. That's helpful. Um, that, that's really helpful. And um, we're dead on time, folks. So thank you very much indeed. Um, there's been a request, Camille, for your references. Um, um, and I certainly know the one on Imperial is, is very good on assessments. Where is that? Can you just tell the person asking briefly? Um, it's in a newspaper, isn't it, uh, about your online assessment? Yeah, so um, that's the Guardian reference. Um, all the references are on the slides and you'll be able to, I understand, look back at the webinar after. So That's right, Harris. Go okay. more, yeah. So. Thank you, Camille. That was a really helpful, practical, and it's lovely to have the young view on how we cope with all these challenges for suddenly moving into a good technology. Thank you so much. So I'm now delighted, and we are very delighted to have you here, Gaia, 
to give us your amazing world perspective on how you've opened it up to millions of people. So thank you very much indeed, and I'll hand over to you now. If you unmute, then we can move on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Val. Thank you, everybody. I'm looking at the screen and seeing I'm the odd person out, but I'm very, very happy to be here. So right at the beginning, let me introduce myself. I'm Gaia Gamhebeke. I am the Head of Learning and Capacity Development for the World Health Organization's Health Emergency Program. And uh, unfortunately, there are many uh, emergencies around the world. Africa, the African continent, we uh, experience at least three um, uh, outbreaks every week. So unfortunately, we've had lots of practice in outbreak management, but more and more we're looking at training and retraining personnel who can work in this. The first thing I must say is I am not in medical education that is accredited. What we do at the World Health Organization is public health education, and the division tends to blur during a real emergency because we have clinicians and non-clinicians working together. My opening slide is, uh, I'm, I'm just sharing with you the pride we have and the happiness that we just celebrated last week, two million enrollments on the www.openwho.org uh, platform. It's a free platform. And I think this is because of the pandemic, uh, we are seeing a surge in numbers. What I'll do in the next four minutes is to share our experience and share some of the learning and hope that this particularly feeds to postgraduate, but also cross-disciplinary education that is required. Next slide, please. Great, so uh, we didn't start during this pandemic. Uh, we've had a demand for massive learning, particularly in the West Africa Ebola outbreak, where I was the international coordinator for training. One day I was asked to train uh, 108,000 responders in six weeks. That was when I really realized the scale of an outbreak response. So quickly after that in 2017, we set up a free platform. And that being free was only one of the conditions we had. We had to focus on reaching the front line. So in your context, it will be general practitioners, but uh, in uh, any epidemic, pandemic context, it could be different people, some clinical, some not clinical. We even trained highly trained ICU teams that came from uh, developed countries who didn't know how to work in low income settings. We had a philosophy to remove barriers. And I really uh, liked the presentation before because it touched on equity. We had to have low bandwidth and offline with our app. It had to be free and it had to be open source. And we realized with our research that having information in your own language was very important. So we have translated into Swahili and Hindi, even into sign language, uh, different courses. And of course, the relevance was very, very important. You'll see that you can, you know, the links are very easy to find and uh, there is a official languages channel and a non-official languages channel. Next, please. So what we do is we're lucky during an emergency, we have the technical experts who come up with the knowledge and the guidance. What we do is focus on learning objectives. We transform these using adult learning techniques. And I agree with some of the challenges that were spoken before about getting attention, having fatigue, you know, what makes people learn online is very different than face to face. And we need to translate and make sure people get it disseminate widely. Uh, so the numbers are, are, are good. They're growing really fast. Next uh, line, please. Next slide. And this is just uh, later. You can look at it. This is the six, uh, nine big courses we have in all of the languages. So we have very general ones from introduction to COVID to uh, management of secure, um, severe acute respiratory infections, clinical care, how to set up your facility to do uh, reception, triage, treatment, discharge, and so on. Next one, please. And you can see amazing, you know, how, how it just took off. In January, we had 180,000 people. And you can see, you know, with each global meeting that talked about this, with the declaration of the public health emergency of international concern, the declaration of the pandemic, how the numbers just kept going up. And this is from 196 countries. Next slide. So what have we learned? Let me just take the last minute to do that. Uh, for us, for public health in emergencies, I, I believe WHO is a trusted brand. And because knowledge was new, it was a new virus, I think that really helped with the numbers. We really had to focus on what the learner needed. 
and and this was the the thing to get right what did the frontline responder need you had to be confident about your content so i only transformed into trainings that were the already who guidance we had to regularly update the material because as the knowledge grew our courses have been updated three four times in the last three months we had to remove barriers i think it was important to remember that the most successful courses are the ones with a human face a practitioner or an expert talking not just lecturing but having an interaction with people uh, we had to acknowledge that the learner is under stress uh, they are frightened for themselves, for their health, well-being, their families. This is not here is a victim and we are rescuers. We now are all in the same boat and the psychology of that is very challenging. We had to be very explicit about our purpose. Uh, we Also, the technical platform has to be able to grow with these numbers in a pandemic. And we follow the data, so we really analyze the data. I think my last uh, point is to say I don't really believe things will go back to what they were before. We are all having to shift with the fourth uh, uh, industrial revolution, the growth in biotech and digital tech. It is going to be, we're going to have to use digital means going forward. And we ourselves are struggling, you know, how to do competency assessments, how to keep up standards. But I'm really happy to be part of this conversation and uh, hopefully work with Wonka looking at the future of life learn, learn, lifelong learning in public health and not just in medicine. I'll stop there for now. Thank, thank you so much, Gaia. Um, I think one of the joys of doing this webinar has been meeting you and, and sharing. We share so much in common. I believe I found a kindred spirit. So thank you so much. Can I just check with my partner in crime? Victor, do you want to put a question in here? Before we move on, have you got one lined up? We do, actually. In fact, thanks, uh, Val. So this question I'm going to direct to Joy uh, Mugambi from Kenya. So there's been discussion of how we actually teach, uh, uh, whether it's trainees or residents. I guess in your context, Joy, uh, you know, I'm curious to understand, you know, how are you adapting to virtual technology and how are you engaging with your residents? Could you give us some examples and, and some techniques that you've used? Uh, thank you very much, Victor, and thanks to the speakers who have come uh, up ahead. Uh, for us in Kenya, I do part-time lecturing at Tabarak University. We've always had a blended model of teaching, both classroom and virtual, and as well as clerkship in the resident areas where our residents are. Uh, we've not had any difficulties because this is something that started off at the very beginning of our program uh, where we've had virtual learning going through from the Blackboard app. So we had just shifted from the Blackboard app to a different app that we had started training our residents as well as doing their exams through the, the virtual platform. So it's been easy. It's uh, uh, something that's very doable in places where there's internet access. Though yes, there are challenges sometimes when internet is down, electricity is down, uh, those challenges do come up, but those can be mitigated by um, doing the on-site trainings as well as uh, exams at their residence uh, clerkship areas. Thank you. Back to you, Victor. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Joy, for that. I think I'll move on to Val, and I think Val will introduce our, our next speaker. Thanks. Thanks so much, Victor. Thank you, Joy, as well. It's lovely to have these views from all over the world. So now, Vivi, can we move to you in the USA? And you'll, I'll leave you to introduce yourself and your talk. But thank you so much for volunteering. Truly grateful. Thank you so much, Val. Thank you so much to everyone in the panel. I'm Viviana Martinez Bianchi. I am uh, the program director of the Family Medicine Residency Program at Duke. And I'm also a member of the Wonka Executive. Um, so family medicine residents or trainees are considered essential personnel in primary healthcare settings. And thus they should be considered to be essential in the fight against COVID on the front lines with the proper supervision and PPE. 
As the pandemic arrived at each country, however, many training programs around the world removed family medicine trainees from their regular clinical sites. Some became quarantined due to exposure. Some are told to wait until programs can figure out the situation on the ground. Many rotations were canceled. Service considered non-essential, stop seeing patients, and then the residents didn't have an elective rotation to go to. Some program directors pulled residents from rotations out of fear. As a residency program director, I understand this feeling of fear confronting a pandemic of such, such dimensions. Um, and I really know that I don't want to ever have to call the parents of any of my own young trainees to let them know that their son or daughter has been admitted to the intensive care unit, for example. So I understand that. Next slide, please. One of the issues of the current pandemic is that when COVID-19 hit, there were very few senior physicians who have had experiences treating patients with this type of illness and who had expertise in managing the unique treatment and infection control protocols and procedures that were required to do this care. With time, information has become broadly available, including the WHO and our own Wonka websites and the websites of most of our member organizations. And it is important to make sure that residents, fellow and faculty members providing care to patients potentially infected with the coronavirus are fully trained in treatment and infection control protocols before engaging in this care. Next slide, please. Appropriate PPE must be worn and measures to keep sanitation and disinfection need to be maintained even when creativity, when products are not available, comes to the place. One of the slides there shows our colleagues in Argentina making alcohol gel to be able to use it for in their clinical settings. Lack of PPE has cost the lives of healthcare workers all around the world, and we must demand the presence. Next slide, please. Physical isolation has impacted the educational component of residency training. Conference sessions that have largely moved online, with some still doing in-person lectures, but maintaining that physical distance within their settings. Gaia touched on this before. Somebody had asked in the chat, what are the best practices? You know, being brief, short times, engaging people. Zoom, for example, allows moving uh, trainees into different rooms to be able to have separate discussions on topics. Next slide, please. In many cases, family medicine trainees have re been repurposed to work in the inpatient setting, supporting internal medicine, intensive care units, labor and delivery floors, inpatient pediatrics. The comprehensive training of their specialty allows family doctors to serve in any aspect of the health system. They can get pulled into many places where they're useful during these COVID times. Next slide, please. Residents are developing their skills as clinicians, but doing so in the current healthcare environment means adjusting daily routines to embrace new norms while surrounded by uncertainty. With guidance, they can apply their situational leadership skills and understand flexibility and reorganization while working as members of teams. Next slide. In the middle of the chaos, Family medicine rises, understanding the community more than any other specialty. Our trainees were not going to let themselves be defeated by, fearly, by, by fear, certainly not without a fight. Family medicine team membership and belonging builds that resilience needed during these difficult times. Strengthening the role of family medicine in their medical community, challenging inequities in access to testing and care, creating public service announcements and, committee, and committees to address the multiple needs people have, which have been identified in conjunction with community partners. Next slide, please. Family medicine trainees all around the world have the capacity of working in the front lines, seeing the whole family unit, connecting with the people, managing chronic conditions, maintaining preventive measures like timely immunizations, visiting families in need, while wearing PPE, we must avoid the collateral damage on the unmanaged preventive and treatable conditions that we always see in primary health care. We must become involved in community action. Next slide, please. 
reaching their patients via telehealth and learning the art of communication with the patient via virtual platforms. Telehealth checklists have been created to make sure residents are adapting appropriate bedside manner to the virtual in environment. There's an art to do in telehealth and the, 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 the patient-doctor interaction is always there in a very important way. Next slide. In the words, in the words of Monica Nivello from Chile, a colleague whose faculty at the Universidad de Chile, residents need guidance to avoid heroes who avoid becoming heroes who will risk their personal health to save lives without the proper PPE. They must take care of themselves to continue caring, comply with protocols of personal protection of patients, of their colleagues, of themselves, and on the workspaces. Reinforce that even in the middle of a catastrophe, they have to try to act according to the evidence optimizing resources, that they keep in mind the principles of family medicine and the comprehensive healthcare model and primary healthcare in their actions, while also taking good care of themselves. Next slide, please. Family medicine must work with communities to defeat the coronavirus. A disease in the community needs a family medicine and community health response. Our trainees and faculty are ready for the challenge in these difficult times. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vivi. Fascinating, and you're doing some wonderful work there as well. Technical question, Victor, do you need Maria to look at her chat? about? Do you need Maria Marie to look at her chat? I, I, yes, I, I was uh, wondering if, if Maria is able to see the chat, but, but maybe we can uh, ask As we go on to the uh, next question, but Maria, yeah, we'll could you look at your chat? Okay, over yeah. to you, Victor, for questions. That's right. Okay, thank you very much, Val. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll move on. I just wanted to address a couple of the questions uh, in the uh, uh, chat and the question and answer. So this uh, webinar is focused more on education and training. We'll probably have other webinars uh, down the road that focuses on clinical care of COVID. So we'll maybe park those questions for now and then we'll focus on more on the ones that are uh, have to do with training and education. So we do want to note that and that's really good participation uh, and, and acute, uh, uh, acute acumen from our, from our uh, folks that are listening. So I do have a question that I want to direct at uh, Nagwa from um, uh, Egypt. So, so Vivi had a really good presentation describing uh, teaching and, and learning both for residents and also uh, her as a teacher. I guess, you know, it, it is very novel for us as teachers to, to have to uh, teach virtually and engage with our students doing that. How do we as ourselves, you know, Nagwa, in your own context in Egypt, um, how do you upskill yourself to do that? Number one, to be able to uh, treat your patients yourself virtually and also to role model that to your uh, students. Um, thanks for the question. That's actually a tricky one. I'm the director of the Medical Education and Human Resources Development Center and taking the lead to develop that F is something huge where I was able to get uh, that skills. I, I am a fortunate person because I have two big families. I have the Wonka family and I have the Famer family. Uh, so both of them, uh, I was able to do the community of practice. So um, being um, uh, networking with others, uh, trying to improve uh, ourselves uh, by the community of practice, by attending webinars, by trying to find what is the best uh, evidence for doing uh, this shift right now with the network of both members in both families, actually, it has been beneficial to me. So doing that. That, um, based on them and which had been this whole thing fascinating. So all of this had worked together in order to be able to gain the basic competency to deliver uh, what do we need to our faculty and to our students too, because our students um, were having a technology problems uh, during that shift and how to deal with and how to, to, to adapt to that. Um, having this network of experience with others definitely made a value for what is, had been done so far. So thank you to my big family, both big families. Back to you, Victor. But next question. I think you've contacted Mari, have you? 
Yeah, sorry, uh, Val, my, my uh, computer just froze there for a second. Yeah, maybe, I thought maybe, something. Uh, Forgive yeah. us, everyone. We do have these little hiccups. That, that's the issue with, with webinars and working from home. We're all at the... Uh, the, the okay, the, the are you going over to Mari the... now? That's right. So, so Mari, I guess what, what I might do is get your uh, feedback on, on the same question probably as Nagwa and in your own context in, in Pakistan. You know, just thinking about how, how you uh, adapt to this virtual context. How are you engaging with your patients uh, virtually? And then also, you know, how, how is it that you're able to role model that, that to your students? Right. Thank you, Victor. Uh, we have actually developed a telemedicine clinic. Uh, at our university, we are doing it through uh, telephonic consultations, but in some universities, it's also through telehealth, where they're using free online software, which can actually uh, be downloaded and uh, multiple users can use it. So there's a university in Punjab, which is another province of Pakistan, where uh, it's a 24 hour consultation uh, where different people come in, physicians come in and they do the consultation over there. Um, the only challenge is how do you get to standardize care? Because physicians are coming from all over the country. These are volunteers uh, to answer not just COVID, questions but also general health uh, questions and for that we are currently in the process of developing simple guidelines for different uh, health issues or different complaints so that everybody uh, sort of is standardized in giving the type of care. The reason we have only telephonic consultation in our university is uh, we cater to the low socioeconomic class. Many of them do not even have smartphone so for them it's much easier to do a telephonic consultation and for that we have to do a lot of uh, um, uh, background uh, teaching ourselves on how to do telephonic as well as e-consultation. Very good. Uh, thank you very much, Maria, for that perspective. So I'll turn it back to Val for our next presenter. Okay. Thank you. And, and well done, team. We're, we're on time and we're doing well. So finally, Robin, you can relax. You're on air. Thank you, Robin. Uh, thank you, Val. Um, and thank you to all the presenters that have uh, come before me. Um, so yeah, hi, I'm, I'm everyone. I'm Robin Ramsey. I'm um, a family doctor working just outside of Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, but I'm speaking to you today in my capacity as program director for the Master of Family Medicine um, online program at the University of Edinburgh. So we've been teaching um, family doctors in a postgraduate setting online for the past five years, exclusively online. Um, so I want to share some of our experiences of dealing or adapting um, during COVID and hopefully stimulate some more discussion. Um, so all of our students are actually in low, most of them are, are in low and middle income countries. Um, so, and they come from a variety of different countries. So they do um, have diverse educational needs. So that's the other thing that we try to address in our program. Um, the first thing we did as a team was we tried to engage our students and identify their learning needs. This is something that's already been mentioned as a theme. Um, and we use um, uh, Blackboard Collaborate, uh, the, the system that Joy mentioned. Um, so most of our students have access to this via um, their app and it's a system um, similar to Zoom. Um, what we decided to do was we, we started off by, by using interactive sessions. Um, you can actually use um, a whiteboard on Collaborate and you can do the similar thing on Zoom where students can be posed questions or um, open questions and they can, they can actually comment on a board um, and you can sort of collate different responses. Um, and you can also use polling, and there's lots of different ways you can sort of enhance your use of, of, of these sort of, of Zoom and, and Collaborate. And, and so it's very interactive. And this is what we, um, the sort of process we went through. Of course, when we first addressed the students, they wanted information from us. Uh, and these are the sorts of um, areas that they wanted to, to, to learn about and, and the top box there. And, and this, of course, sort of represents the comprehensive response of family medicine to the pandemic. But what we recognized as the discussion went on was that actually giving them information was not what they needed because there was information overload um, from, from a variety of different sources. 
Um, but coupled with that, the staff and the students had less time. So all our teachers are also clinicians. So we all had less time. There's lack of evidence. So providing good evidence-based information is difficult. Um, but also our students have varied experiences. So some of them are working in private sector, some of them public sector, um, working in different countries with different sort of um, government protocols and things. And of course, the information is rapidly changing over time as well. So this leads to a lot of uncertainty and, and anxiety amongst the, the students. And this, again, is a theme that I think has come up. So what we recognised was that these are family doctor students require common sort of skills in order to deal with all these things, this information overload, this anxiety. And those are skills that we teach actually in our master's program anyway, but we kind of have enhanced that. So things like critical thinking, uh, reflection, critical evaluation of different sources of information, um, adaptability, self-care. And I'm going to add academic writing to that as well. That's something we've taught this week because we want our students to be able to actually write about their experience of the pandemic. And next slide, please. Um, so the next stage um, was the adapting stage. Again, another common theme discussed um, today. So our learners had to adapt, our, our teachers, teachers had to adapt. But the most important thing to us was that our, our institution, the university, adapted and adapted very quickly. Um, and one of the things they did was that they, they collated a lot of the resources that they had and actually increased access to them. So um, that was very useful to us. But they also gave us the flexibility to, for example, alter our assessments and change our current online courses to include teaching about COVID. So, one of the successful things we've done, for example, is changed our assessment to include blog writing on um, experiences of COVID and teaching the specific skill of blog writing alongside that. Um, along with the adaptability, we, we also have recognised that our students are quite anxious about this actual process. But one of the things we found beneficial is that it's important for them to, to be aware that they already possess these so-called soft skills that you can see in this diagram here. One of them being adaptability and family doctors have all these skills within them. Um, and just by addressing that and, and allowing students to reflect on that, we feel that it's actually helped them to realize um, the, some of the skills that they naturally have um, within them. And next slide, please. Um, the final part of the process for us is, is connection. Um, Camille mentioned uh, this, this sort of development of the community of practice. Um, but we've taken it a bit further to this international uh, community of practice. And I've seen the benefit of this over the years, particularly working with Wonka and you know, doing you know, international exchanges with the young doctor movements and, and things like that. This, by developing this international community of practice, you really do benefit all the members through shared experience. Um, and I think what we've learned is to try and focus on uh, common values. Um, I love this quote by Ian McQuinney, which says, um, when taken together, the, the principles of family medicine represent a world view. Um, so when we're connecting with our students and doing our webinars, we often sort of bring it back to these sort of common principles of family medicine, these common values that we that we have and we try and build our teaching around them. Um, so that sort of overcomes the diversity um, within our group. And this connection at the end of the day is about promoting personal well-being. It's one of the, the, uh, the main parts of what we're trying to achieve is keeping our students well um, during this process. And I'll just end by the sort of tagline that we use at the end of our own webinars, which is um, take it steady because we know that this isn't, this isn't going to be a short term process. Um, but I think through connection and through sort of using online and teaching and, and new ways of working, perhaps there's some silver lining at the end of this pandemic and we can in, in improve and increase our, our community of practice. So thank you. I'll move back to, to Val now. Thank you so much, Robin, and, and thank you for pulling that so nicely together. 
reminding us of our values and reminding us that we are a community of practice. And I think we're learning today, we're here for our learners, but we're also here to support ourselves as educators. And, and it's privileged to be with you all. The, the really good news, Victor, is we've now got nearly 15 minutes for questions, so we can bring other views in before we lead to Anna, who's highly, go, highly going to sum up for us. But you've got, I reckon, um, a good 15 minutes almost for your questions now. So I'll hand over to you. And just another thank you to Sonia and Kim, who've been, look so calm there in the background, uh, but I'm sure you're paddling furiously underneath. So thank you for keeping us going. We're really, really grateful. Over to you, Victor. It's, uh, thank you, Val. And, and, and definitely Sonia and Kim are, are typing away and, and, and uh, it's a, a difficult uh, keeping up with all the activity. I do want to address a couple of the questions in the uh, Q&A. Uh, I know there's been some questions about posting resources and, and you know, Val and I, I think we need to see how we can, can uh, pursue that after the webinar is over. I think that's really good advice for us to be able to uh, share resources that we think, you know, at Wonka are, are, are useful and to share that with our um, viewers. Just to feed in there, Victor, because I know it's a huge issue for the working party. I'm meeting with Harris in Monday week, aren't we, Harris? I'm going to try and use him to get our resources up there. So we're on the case. Excellent, excellent. We'll pass that to Harris. Excellent, excellent uh, delegation, Val. Good leadership. Okay, all right. So, <laughs> clap, clap, clap from uh, Garth. So, what we'll do now is we'll move on to questions. I've got two questions uh, already one for uh, Joy and then one for Maria afterwards. So, the first question is for uh, Joy. So, thinking about you know the, the presentations that we've heard that describe the undergraduate medical education, postgraduate medical education, and CPD, and the idea of the uh, uh, the continuum of education, how how has you know in some ways has the COVID nineteen pandemic actually uh, provided an opportunity for us to to take away some of the artificial divisiveness between those three kind of sections, or you know if we think about uh, our resources and learning. Can we produce virtual learning that could really be applied to all three? And, and you know, I, I'd just be interested in some of your perspectives, Joy, um, around that and whether we can sort of take away that, that divisiveness between those three artificial barriers to education. Uh, thank you very much, Vic. Yes, we've had a lot of division in, in those three key areas. But one thing that we have done is we've integrated, yes, the undergraduate students, the residents, and the doctors to participate in most of the CPD activities instead of just doing one webinar that's just um, speaking to doctors alone or one webinar that's speaking to residents or, or the undergraduate students, we've been doing webinars that bring us together, which are multidisciplinary, not just presenting one discipline at a time. So this has really brought out integration and uh, also collaboration between different departments so that we share what we need to learn and uh, bring out the education path that really integrates all key areas together. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Joyce. So that was very uh, insightful. And, and I think, you know, in, in some ways, that's going to be a, an issue that we're going to have to explore as we go forward in this sort of uh, uh, new era, I guess, of education. So the next question I have for Maria, um, thinking a little bit about how we, we take away some of the barriers to undergraduate, postgraduate, NCP, I guess maybe you can speak a little bit about in, even interprofessional education. So if you think about family medicine as a team, we work with other disciplines, you know, whether they be specialists or even uh, nursing and other uh, uh, professionals. How does, how does this environment Environment create um, challenges for us to teach and work together in this um, in this sort of multidisciplinary team. Is there some ways that we can um, engage with learning with nurses or engage with learning with cardiologists? You know, what are some experiences and some advice that you could offer us, Maria? Right. Uh, so, Victor, we've been uh, working with nurses. Actually, we have developed a course, a COVID course for general practitioners. Uh, for Pakistan, which went online and it's been very successful. And then we realized that the people who are in the front line are actually not just doctors, but the paramedical staff and the nurses. 
And so we worked with the nurses in the university to develop a course, which they have actually developed for the nursing as well as the paramedical staff. And, uh, it, you know, when we were working together, it really uh, gave us a perspective of the other profession and how they, uh, what are their um, areas that they are expert in and how do they move forward? What are their thinking processes? And it really helps in us when we think of how we're going to train our GPs who have nurses as well as other uh, pharmacists, dispensers in their clinic. Uh, so it builds a collaborative environment where the team is actually the most important part. And I think what we learn from our process is the teamwork. Wonderful, Maria. And I think you really hit it on the head with the teamwork. I think, you know, whether it's in a physical environment where we're all, we're all together or whether it's a virtual environment, it's really that teamwork and communication and collaboration that uh, really uh, glues all of us together. Uh, I've got another question for uh, Nagwa, so I'll turn it over to you. Uh, you're in, I, I look down because you're at the bottom of my screen, but you actually might be at the top of the screen for somebody else. <laughs> in any case, the um, question for you is about students. So we, we look at you know, the virtual environment of learning, and of course, you know, we, we think of ourselves as the teachers and the preceptors, but probably in the use of virtual technology, our students may actually be more gifted in that than, than um, we are. So I guess from your context, could you comment on maybe some of the lessons that it may be a reverse classroom where where the teachers are actually teaching the teachers as opposed to us you know thinking that we're, we're the wise uh, professors uh, offering them the knowledge what are your thoughts Magua? Uh, you just hit it correctly we think we think that we are the teachers meanwhile we are teaching the technology generation who actually knows a lot about this issue so a lot of lessons have been heard this is a learning experience a huge learning experience for both of us Actually, we went with that concept and turned upside down after the first contact. After the first week, it went upside down because the students had a completely different point of view. We were doing something traditional. They, they didn't like that. They want different apps. They have been directing us, actually, I have to say that. They have been saying, no, this app is not suitable. We cannot go by this. Actually, we do prefer to have a live discussion, posting the lecture. Actually, we do prefer to do that on X, on Y, post questions, kindly use that app for doing that. At the start, maybe we were slightly rigid in responding, but because it's finally that you'd like to put them on the right track, we had to listen and listening get marvelous results. By then, because uh, that's fun. learning is the advice is to be flexible, to be adaptable, and also to listen to the students and to listen to I think we have an interactive uh, part. I think we're losing you a bit, Nagwa. Um, Do you hear me now? That's a bit better, I think. I think okay. you woke up a bit. I think perhaps we leave you there till we get the right connection. Um, Victor, do we just would we just like to have Gaia's perspective? Did she answer you there? Yeah, so we've got actually Gaia uh, able to uh, answer a question. So, you know, certainly Gaia is our, our guest today and, and uh, we definitely want her perspective. I guess hearing a lot of uh, different perspectives on, on undergraduate, uh, postgraduate and CBD, Gaia, and, and, you know, sitting from your position from the WHO, what are some further initiatives you think, you know, hearing some of the feedback of family doctors around the world that, that you think the WHO can provide further resources and guidance, you know, as we, as we move forward with this pandemic and, and, and further, of course, beyond as we're planning for the future. What are your thoughts, Kaya? Thanks very much, Victor. I think the pandemic is just accelerating something inevitable. We, we are really working in multidisciplinary teams. Uh, the pandemic has allowed people, even old dinosaurs like me, to embrace technology. I mean, whether we like it or not, we have to do it. It's, it's forced this on us, right? And um, I think the demand from people uh, from uh, professionals, from doctors, from everybody for current usable 
uh, knowledge and skills building is going to be immense. I, I really believe this. I think with the biotech industry moving so fast, your patients as family doctors are going to have a different understanding of health their role in maintaining your health and the whole relationship will transform. So I think going forward, what we've had is the opportunity. Now, I told you we're following the data of these millions of users. I can tell you how many three and a half minutes people get bored and leave the page. You know, we're doing that kind of analytics and I think we should publish these and we should share what is optimal for adults who are busy, uh, and go beyond the digital divide. The digital divide is one thing, but there are many other things that stop people from learning. From WHO's perspective, what we are trying to do is work with uh, institutions and associations such as yourself to shape the future of public uh, future of learning for public health. We know that 95% of countries around the world will not meet the target three, the health target of the Sustainable Development Goals. 95% won't reach it. So this is a terrible statistic. So we are going to need to shape training, learning, education in public health. Not the way we want to deliver, but the way people want to consume it. So I think, you know, really, I, I think this is amazing. It's about collaboration. It's about use orientation. It's about getting the student to take over as moderators sometime. The nut that we are trying to crack in WHO, the digital learning is easy, but the competency assessment is hard. And I really appreciate hearing from Imperial College and others about how to assess this. But this is something we can only do together. This, this has to be a collective approach. And unless we get ahead of the curve, <laughs> you know, we are all going to lose. So I'm really, I'm tremendously grateful for this opportunity to interact with you. Great. Thank you uh, very much, Gaia. I think, you know, I, I really echo what you're saying is that, you know, in some ways, the disasters really offered us an a, a impetus to really move forward into the future and, and further collaboration and recognizing that the world is, in fact, uh, smaller than we, we expect. And, and uh, certainly your leadership and your guidance is, is very much well welcomed. I think we have time for one more question, uh, Val, probably, I would say. Five more questions or five more minutes? I, I'm going to take that as five more minutes. All right, okay, let's, let's move along. <laughs> I'm gonna direct the next question over to uh, Joy. Joy, if you're uh, able to listen to us there. Um, I guess, you know, one of the, the things that we've heard and understanding from even from what Gaia was saying is that, you know, we're, we're moving towards the future and, and thinking about, you know, further ahead. I guess if you imagine yourself as a teacher probably in 10 years time or 15 years time or 20 years time, you know, how do you think your, your interactions will be? And, and in some ways, you know, probably, in that time, we'll, we'll, we'll think of hopefully COVID-19 as a bit of, of history as opposed to the present. You know, what opportunities do you think there are, you know, as, as a teacher in 2030 or a teacher in 2045 or, or down the road? What, what, do you, what do you see your role and how do you see that, that uh, will evolve as teachers? Uh, thank you very much, Vic. Um, yes, we've learned quite a lot from this experience because the students are teaching us quite a lot. I thought I was very tech savvy, but I have learned quite a lot during this period of, um, of COVID because a lot of things have changed. Our system actually changed from uh, the normal system that we used to teach using the Blackboard to model, uh, Modly, uh, which is a very different system. And the reason was the students felt the other system wasn't working for them. We've moved to this new system. But I think um, in the coming future, as we go forward, we'll learn quite a lot uh, from technology and we'll have to adapt quite a lot. Um, we have been preparing uh, systems, but systems have to change to what is happening within the world. And um, probably in the future, we'll not be talking about um, teaching in Kenya. We'll be talking about teaching worldwide from Kenya, uh, other than what we are doing now locally. Thank you, Vic. Well, I uh, thank you, uh, Joy, and I look forward to that. I think it'd be great 
to be able to have you know the world as our classroom and also vice versa and to be able to uh, um, enjoy all the experiences that we're learning from around the world you know i think one of the, the interesting uh, concepts that we've learned from this COVID 19 is that as there's been unfortunately disaster that happened around the world we're actually learning very very quickly uh, certainly in the clinical world we learned from asia we learned in europe and of course unfortunately in new york we're also learning from all the lessons that people have, have gathered from, from COVID-19. So in some ways, I think I echo your, your sentiments, Joy, that in fact, our world is gonna get smaller uh, relating right. to education uh, as opposed to uh, getting larger. Uh, I'll turn it back to Val, I think. Thank you, thank you so much, Victor. Well, Harris, I think we're dead on timing. Phew. <laughs> it always reminds me of Nelson's Mandela that education is the most powerful weapon to change the world. Uh, and I think working together as a team uh, under the Wonka umbrella, which we're terribly grateful for, Donald, um, that this shows us the way we can move forward. We will try and answer all the questions. I haven't quite worked out how, because I think it's been a huge chat going on there. Thank you, team, for monitoring that. And Victor, thank you for taking the challenge of doing the questions. I'm really grateful. We are in the future still looking, aren't we, guys, of ways of getting a resource on the website. And I'm sure that with Harris's young technology, excuse me, guys, but we are a similar generation, um, we will be able to move forward for our working party and for all of Wonka that we can really get an exciting resource going. But in the meantime, I'm looking with Harris as how we can get all the resource today out. So now, we're looking really forward to working with you, Anna, when you become our president. But as our president-elect, can we hand you the privilege of summing up? And thank you very much for agreeing to do it. I'll say goodbye now from all of us from the Wonka Working Party and hand you back to Anna and Donald to sign off. So thank you very much indeed. And a big thank you to Harris. Thank you. You need to unmute. No, I've been uh, silent. Yes, I've been silent for so long. So I have <laughs> my own voice. Here I am. Good afternoon from Osley. Thank you, Val, and your crew, your crew of educators and learners. I think we all hold both roles. That has been very clear to me uh, during the last hour. Thank you for presentations and discussion. Thank you also for input from participants online. While listening today, um, a quote by a British colleague, Denise um, Gray Pereira came to my mind. He said something like, general practice is the easiest job to do badly and the hardest job to do well. Um, I think we, we can submit to that statement and this pandemic um, has uh, provided us with or provides us with quite challenging environments clinically and also for, for education. Uh, we are living a huge experiment, said Nagua. And this is forced upon us, Gaia said. And I think we, we, uh, we, we realize that this is true. So training is needed. Training of clinicians and training of educators. And we must train each other. Um, it's not necessarily about teaching new knowledge I learned today. It's also about changing behavior. And to do that, to induce change of behavior, uh, we must adapt to the needs of the learners. This approach complies well with the quote, Harris, I think you've got a slide there, by the Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard on the art of helping. If one is truly to succeed, and you can read it because now I, can, I do not know it by heart and I cannot see the whole screen, but the essence is we have to find him where he is and begin there. And this is true, whatever environments we are working in. There is a need for innovation in medical education, 
as well as in research. And this awful pandemic provides us with the opportunities in that direction. From what I've heard today, I think we are on the right track. We are up to the task. Thank you once again. I'll hand over to you, Garth and Donald, to conclude. Thank you very much, Anna, and thanks, uh, Ethel Vowell's sentiments. Thank you to, the, to, to the, the entire team and to everybody. And I'd like to hand over to Donald now for his concluding remarks. So, Donald, over to you. Right. <clears throat> Before I make my concluding remarks, let me advertise our next webinar on May the 3rd, same time. As we all know, the outburst, next slide, please. The outburst of the COVID-19 pandemic has had a significant impact on the incidence of family violence. Not only have some of the risk factors greatly increased by the lockdown, economic crisis, and social isolation, but also the availability of specialized services and ways of assessing them have changed significantly. Next please. So the aim of the next webinar will be to give an overview of family violence, highlighting special aspects related to the pandemic offer practical tools useful to family doctors in daily practice, as well as in the current situation. So see you next Sunday at uh, the same time. So to conclude, thank you, next please, panelists for leading a wonderful presentation. All those tuned in, thank you for joining us. I wish to say that this is a pandemic with an unknown end game. I wish each and every one of you family doctors well during this time. Use the best advice available, work collaboratively with your teams, do the best you can for your patients. You should stand proud of your contribution to tackling this world crisis. No one knows what we will face in the weeks and months ahead, but everyone knows enough to understand that COVID-19 will test our capacities to be kind and generous and to see beyond ourselves and our own interests. Our task now is to bring the best of who we are and what we do to a world that is more complex and more confused than any of us would like it to be. May we all proceed with wisdom and grace. Thank you very much. Go. Thank you, Donald. Thank you for those inspiring words. Um, and again, thank you to all the panel. Um, to everybody who's taken part today, to all of those of you who are online, please join us again next week for the webinar on family violence. And until then, everyone, please stay safe. Thank you all. Good afternoon.